سلام دوستان در ادامه ویدیوهای مصاحبه با اساتید استرالیا امروز میخوایم مصاحبه ای که با یکی از اساتید دانشگاه ملی استرالیا یا استرالیان نشنال یونیورسیتی انجام دادم رو با هم ببینیم اگر مایل به دیدن این مصاحبه هستی در ادامه این ویدیو با من همراه باشید میلاد هستم و شما دارید یکی دیگه از ویدیوهای کانال بای اسکیل رو تماشا میکنید من به صورت هفته یه سری ویدیو در مورد آموزش زیست شناسی مولکولی و بیو آفوماتیک و یه سری ویدیو در مورد تجربه تحصیل و زندگی توی استرالیا رو با شما به اشتراک میذارم اگر به دیدن این سر ویدیو ها علاق منید لطفا این پایین روی دکمه سابسکرایب کلیک کنید و اگر رو اون زنگوله کنار سابسکرایب هم کلیک کنید وقتی من ویدیو جدیدی منتشر میکنم و ساتون نوتیفیکیشن میاد و میتونید تشریف بیارید و اون ویدیو رو ببینید دوستان قبل از اینکه بریم ویدیو رو ببینید بذارید من یه نکته کتا خدمتون بگم با این دید به این ویدیو ها نگاه کنید که شما میخواد یه ایمیل بنویسید میخواد یه انگیزه نامه بنویسید توی این ویدیو ها میتونید یاد بگیرید که چه نکته هایی واسه استاد ها مهم هستن و ایمیلتون رو و یا انگیزه نامتون رو احتمالا ایمیل مهم تره چون که اولین چیزی که استاد میبینه اون طوری تنظیم کنید که اونا میخوان شما یه کاغذ قلم بردارید هر چیزی که توی ایمیل میگن هم این مصاحبه هم مصاحبه های قبلی هم مصاحبه که در آینده پخش میکنم خدمتون ببینید چی استادا میخوان به ترتیب بنویسید اون نکات مهمی که واسهشون در واقع کلیدیه بعد سعی کنید ایمیلتون رو به اون ترتیب تنظیم کنید و قطعا مطمئن باشید وقتی شما این ایمیل رو برای استاد بفرستید میتونید تحت تاثیر قرارش بدید و رازیش کنید و متقاعدش کنید که ایمیل شما رو باز کنه و بخونه و شاید بره سراغ مدارکتون پس با نوشتن یک ایمیل مرتب و در واقع ایمیلی که در موردش فکر کردین میتونید شانس موفقیت خودتون رو بالا ببرید بریم با همین مصاحبه رو ببینیم Let's uh, jump to the question. Actually, my first question is that what attracts your uh, attention when you receive an email from a student? I mean, what's most important to you? CV, SOPI, proposal, transcript, etc. I'd have to say, I mean, the first thing is, is just to get the impression that they have actually looked at my research and, and maybe my papers. Um, because actually, I get a lot of emails that are just... Uh, from all over the world um, that that look like a um, like a, a pre-filled form email okay so it's it's kind of it just looks like spam it just sort of says dear professor Brock and and this is in different uh, different font than the rest of the letter and it's just like I'm I've you know I've studied this and this and this I want to to come and work in your lab but they don't reference what uh what the lab is and and generally i don't respond to those emails because it's it it's just i, I get so many and i'm just so busy and um it's it's pretty clear that uh it's just sort of a, a mass email to to many different email addresses at least that's what it appears to be um if if i get an email that actually sort of appears to be uh, personally written and and they talk about actually my research and and it's clear that they they have an interest and um they've they've actually looked at my research and, and they're interested in my research then i always reply even if it's just to say you know i, I would love to but i my lab is full or i don't have funding to to support international students at this time uh but but yes yeah, so the the trick is to to not be confused with the former category okay So if, if you're going to email a, a lab leader, make sure you actually uh, talk about what aspects of their research interests you. And e- even if you reference a couple of their papers, then that really shows that you've taken the time to, to look at their research and what they do and um, sort of will give you a, a much better interest. But assuming you, you do that, then of, of course, you know, I get a lot of international students and Uh, applications and, and getting uh, sourcing funding um, is difficult with the scholarships especially given the current uh, financial situation with the COVID pandemic uh, so of course you try to to rank students uh, based on merit and and also their um, if I'm serious about a student I'll always email their academic references um, and uh, I've, I've had a, quite a few students sort of provide reference emails that are Gmail addresses and, and things. So, so that doesn't really, uh, that's a little bit disconcerting. So if, if, if you're providing an academic 
reference, make sure you provide their academic sort of institutional email address. So it's, you know, it's, otherwise you could be emailing their best friend uh, who's pretending to be their <laughs> professor, you know? So um, th those are important things. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're the main things. Uh, so uh, is it important that what is their G GPA? I mean, like uh, above 80, 90, 84. I, I know you don't want a student with 50 from uh, 50 of 100. I know that you don't want them. Yeah. But what about like a normal one? Like, because it, sometimes it's not a very fair competition. Like uh, some students who study in different universities uh, actually are under different scoring system. You know that like some of them are getting a score more easy. And some of them are, you know, you know what I'm telling exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that, um, yeah, for those reasons, I don't personally put a lot of stock um, and, and importance on GPA scores. That will factor in if they're going for an international scholarship, and and the ANU, my institution, has has those, and they're very competitive. So you need to get to have a good GPA, but also. Um, me and, and I think the, the scholarship selection committee take uh, probably much more into account publications and, um, you know, than, than GPA scores. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, if I get an email from a student, um, so, so my field structural biology and, and I've sort of also been getting interested in synthetic biology recently. So when I get an email from a student and they might have a great GPA score and they might have you know, many publications in good journals, but if they're all from a completely different field or not a completely different field, but just another cell biology, let's say, or, you know, even something more different like um, genetics or, uh, then I'll probably put, uh, put less consideration into that application than a student who's clearly interested in structural biology or synthetic biology and, and has a background in that. Um, and, and sort of says that in, in there, uh, or, or at least explains why they would like to get into the field of structural biology, you know, um, rather than just saying, look, I'm a great student and here are my publications, even though they're uh, in, in a distinctly different field than, than your field and, and sort of, I, I, I want, you know, students who are motivated to, to work on the research that I'm doing and not just motivated to get a uh, supervisor um, who, who might get them good publications. So. Interesting. Uh, so let's assume that they get succeed to attract your attention. So probably you will set a Skype interview and these days Zoom interview with them. Uh, so what exactly are, are you looking for in the, in, in the interview? I mean, you're interested in asking scientific questions or general questions. Um, for me, the um, community, just understanding, like having communication, good communication is, is very good uh, because um, I've had a couple of international students and if, if the communication is, is bad due to, to sort of, uh, you know, language proficiency or um, just communication style, then uh, it, it doesn't really matter the, the science because if, if you can't have good communication and work together effectively, then my feeling is that it's going to be, it's going to make everything else difficult. Um, so, so that's the first thing I look for. But, but then, um, you know, just, just talk to them about their science and uh, get a feel for what they're interested in and if their interests align with, with my lab. And um, so, so that's that's the most important thing I would oh, say. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, another thing is that uh, actually a student, especially in undergraduate uh, degree and probably in the master, uh, they're trying to go to the different workshops, uh, which some of them are a little bit costly, actually more than a little bit. And yeah. uh, they are trying to pretend that we know like 100 of techniques and I know everything. <laughs> Actually, I by myself know just five, seven, eight techniques. But uh, some people are, are thinking that if they put thousands of techniques in the CV, um, professor thinks that they are better. 
So what's your opinion about knowing techniques? No, I mean, I, I think I don't really look at the techniques people list unless it correlates with their publications. So um, you can write that that you uh, are proficient in X-ray crystallography, for, for instance, um, because I know that you, sort of we, we share a common research interest there. Um, and that, that you know how to use uh, CCP4 and Phoenix and all the associated software. Uh, but if you've never published anything in structural biology, then it's not like I don't believe you, but it's um, because you can list whatever you like. But um, yeah, uh, I uh, just got a notification that my, I still have 33 minutes on my computer before the battery runs out. Oh, so we that should very, very give us enough time. That. 33 minutes, <laughs> yeah. good, so good. So uh, I actually, I don't have um, too many questions. I don't. Have, I just have two more questions. The first one is, uh, do you know how AGRTPL scholarship scoring system works in your university? I don't. Um, I've sort of spun or sort of supported quite a few few international students applications so far um i don't really know what the intricacies of the um ranking system are but i think there would be several things that that go into that go into it you know the, the quality of the student um and not just their their undergraduate gpa but but their probably their publications um have have very good um, sort of ranking of that the the letters of recommendation that you provide with the um, application so all those things will will come together to I think and be factored into the to the application process uh, but at, at least at my institution they're they're incredibly competitive um, so it's it's really um, you know I, I I would like to to sponsor more students than I do, but at the moment um, I, I've sort of not been doing so to students who I don't feel will be competitive um, be, because there's no point us both putting in a lot of time and effort into the application um, if, if I'm quite certain that it won't be successful. And uh, so my division actually has a HDR convener uh, who who will sort of internally rank the applications before they're sent to the central university admin to, to make sure that sort of because there's I think there's also application fees associated with the sort of applying uh, so we don't want students sort of putting time and, and money into things that aren't going to to eventuate so they are really competitive um, yeah unfortunately okay. That's interesting. And uh, the last question is that some students, uh, actually there is an argument, it's a big argument. Always you can find this argument in my country between the students. Some people are thinking that uh, if you study in a higher ranked university, it brings some points for you uh, during trying uh, to find a supervisor or uh, during um, actually a scholarship application. So does it bring any point or you think not? I, unless it's, you know, you're coming from a university that's um, very well known. And I, I think if you're applying to, to Australia, there'll be a sort of Western bias to that. So if, if you know, if you've gone from a, uh, a PhD or, or even done a project in, in somewhere, you know, a renowned European or American institution, um, that will probably, uh, you know, give them um and and i mean th this is just pure ignorance on my behalf and i assume many other australian academics is that w we're not really aware of of sort of other ranking in in sort of iran or india or um pakistan institutions and i mean i'm sure there are really good universities and not so good universities just like there are everywhere else but Probably, unless we've sort of done done a post up there or, or something, we we probably just don't don't really know. At least I, I don't really. I, I'm not sort of. I, I don't know the best university in Iran, for instance. Um, I I generally just look at the publications um, and sort of what what they've done and, and just just get a feel from from the from the university. Yeah. 
Um, that, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So the summary is that it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's my conclusion. I, I I would say not so much. I mean, unless you've you've sort of done a research project at MIT or Oxford or, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so then of course, um, if you've been motivated and, and skilled and, uh, sort of competitive enough to, to get us something like a scholarship to go to a renowned institution like that, of course, that, that, those sort of names will, uh, pike the, the interest, but, but, um, I, I don't think it will sort of really matter um, exactly what university you go to. And the same in Australia. I mean, you know, uh, I remember thinking this when I was going for a PhD in Australia and whether going to a really good university, uh, ranked university would uh, help my career. But not, not so much. I mean, oh. just what, what you do in your, the actual work you publish and and the research you do is, is going to be the most important thing, not not the reputation of the institution. I That's would say. so interesting. So it will be a concrete answer to that argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Joseph. My question is actually are finished. Thanks a lot for putting attention to actually this interview. خب دوستان این مصاحبه رو هم با هم دیدیم. لطفا اگر نکته مدی نظرتون هست یا سوالی دارید توی بخش کامنت ها واسه من بنویسید و اگر سابسکرایب نکنید لطفا روی دکمه سابسکرایب کلیک کنید و اگر هم از این ویدیو خوشتون اومده لایک فراموشتون نشه. تا ویدیو بعدی خدا نگهدارتون باشه.